one analogy that I I love, I, I read about it in a book years and years ago, because I, I used to read a lot to handle my nerves before competitions. Um, and it was in a James Patterson novel, and it was actually just about five balls that we juggle in life. And they are integrity, uh, health, family, friends, and career. Uh, and they're all really important, um, but there's one key difference. And the career ball is made of rubber. The other ones are a lot more fragile and you really have to look after those and take care with them. The career one, you can take a few more risks with, you can try and throw it higher. If you drop it, it's going to bounce. It's going to take some time to get it back to where it was, um, but it's not the end of the world. If you drop one of the others, then you really are in trouble. So I guess that's something that I've always held true to, like look after your family and friends, appreciate them, value them and be there for them. And don't be afraid to lean on them and use them. Um, integrity is is key to to absolutely everything i think we are what we believe in and what we stand up for and it's one of the things that my dad my grandma my parents have always instilled in me is you stand up for what you believe in and it's something that i see in isla every day i mean she will shout out against something that she thinks is is wrong against one of her friends or or just in in life um and I'm so, so proud of that in her. And I will never try and, and knock that down. I think it, it's very, very important. Sometimes it's not what makes us more popular that we need to say. It's it's what feels right to us. And what my grandma always used to say was every once in a while, step outside of your life and look back in and make sure that you're proud of the person that you are and the way that you're living your life. And if you're not, change it. Um, and I think that, again, is something that I've always tried to to pass on to my kids um, because it's so, so important. It gives us that strength that when life does knock you, and it will, there are difficult periods that we get through, but I think staying true to who you are and standing up for what you believe in certainly helps you to stay strong through those tough times and to believe that you will come through to, to better times. And health is, is, is so, so important as we've talked about all through this. If you don't look after your mental and physical health, um, then it, it's so, so hard. Um, and so I think doing what you can to look after your body because our bodies are amazing things. And if we support them and look after them, I'm um, talking about mental health as much as physical health, then they will, will support us to do everything that we want to do in life and to, to aim for those goals and aim for those dreams. And I guess that's, that's another part of it is setting goals and working steadily towards those goals. Because if you don't, stretch yourself and stretch yourself with full health you will never really know what you're capable of achieving and um that's that's something that my coach said to me when i was 11 um and believed in me and trusted in me today we're very blessed and honored to have paula radcliffe with us who's a british long distance runner and nickname the London and New York Marathon Queen. And until recently, she was the world record holder for being the fastest female for 16 years. And she is still today running for fun. And she started something called the Families on Track, which was, um, instigated or the brainchild of your daughter Isla and that started in 2018 it was actually because our last chat was 2019 just before Christmas and you just done your first one in Durham in 2018 mm -hmm. and I know you've got big plans to bring it here to Monaco and also when I chatted with you, I was absolutely exhausted when I put it down, when we finished the conversation, I was thinking, oh my God, how does she keep going? Because you're so jam packed with all your charities. Like for instance, we have um, one of our members here uh, is the founder of TAF, the Animal Fund. And I know you're an ambassador for that. Mm -hmm. And for the ladies in the group, um, you've also been doing work for the World Health Organization for diabetes and uh, people who are overweight, the children, and you yourself, which I'm amazed at, you know, have been suffering with asthma since you were 14, and yet you managed to deal with it and become the most successful athlete that you have been up to date. 
and I just think it's wonderful all the work that you're doing. But um, could you please tell us, because I know everybody on this call is eager to know, you know, firstly, how did it feel um, when you got the news about your father passing away? Because I know he was a strong pillar of strength for you, you know, both with your career and just as a child growing up, because I know he gave you lots of wonderful advice on life and support. So if you could let us know what that was like and if you were able to go to the funeral or the hospital, because it was right at the start of our lockdown. It was, it was, so it was actually 2020, April of 2020. Um, and um, right at the beginning of really, I guess the pandemic hitting Europe um, seriously. And yeah, I mean, going back to, to what my dad was to me, I think we all have our important role models. And my, my grandma, my dad's mom and my dad were extremely great role models um, for me. And it's one of those things, and I, I think it, it, it's as it should be, but when you're a child growing up, I don't think you ever realize how special your parents are and just what they are doing for you. And it becomes clearer and clearer. The more you go through life, the more you learn, the more you see of other parents uh, and other families. And I kind of, I've, I've really learned from that, how very blessed I was to, to have had such a great support family around me. Um, and I think the hardest thing for me with my dad and my dad being the person he was didn't really complain about things didn't really probably realize what was going on um he had congested heart failure um but he was very scared that it was covid he was taken in and put on the, the covid isolation ward so we weren't allowed to see him i couldn't even get back to the uk to support my mom my mom wasn't allowed in to see him the doctors were convinced it was COVID. Um, I wasn't um, because I didn't see where he could have picked it up from. They'd been so careful. Um, and the tests kept coming back negative. Uh, and I kept saying, can you please just let my mom in to, to see him? And then they put him in intensive care and his lungs started to recover because there wasn't ever really anything wrong with his lungs. Um, and they actually took him off the, the ventilator and that's when his heart failed. Um, and I don't think they thought that would happen. I think they thought it would all go well. Otherwise, I believe they would have let my mom come in. But it was it was a very, very tough time. Um, not least supporting my mom because not being able to be there, she actually had to go through seven or eight weeks um, post losing my dad. So through a virtual funeral on her own, my brother's in Australia. None of us could get there in the end. I pulled a lot of strings and have a lot of gratitude for the Monaco government because they enabled me to bring her in so she could actually just uh, come and, and be with family, which is what she, she really needed. But she was so, so strong through that time, but it has, it has been difficult. I know my dad, my dad's favorite saying was, it is what it is, you get on with it and make the best of it. Um, and I know that's what he would have been saying so many times. And I also relied so much on knowing what advice he would give, the fact that, that the way he brought me up taught me to think on my own two feet and to know what his advice would be when he's not here because I really needed that through the time that um, my daughter was diagnosed um, and through everything that we went through with Isla juggling, trying to make sure that my mom was okay because of course my mom wanted to be here with us but we couldn't figure that out while Isla was going through a treatment as well. So it wasn't until Christmas uh, of 2020 that we were able to get my mom back out here. She had been here in August, um, but when the, the second lockdown came into effect uh, and we were juggling chemotherapy stays and then surgery, um, we just couldn't risk bringing her in for her safety and for Isla's safety. Um, thankfully now everyone's vaccinated and she is supposed to be coming back again to visit next week. And then we will go back with her. Isla's been back at school. So in a, many respects, our story through what Isla went through, we were the lucky ones in terms of it was diagnosed, it was treated very quickly. The prognosis was good. She handled it well. Um, she's even handled catching COVID since uh, um, oh and coping goodness. with that okay. Um, so, so things are, have gone well and I kind of, there's a big part of me knows that my dad and my grandma are pulling for us and making sure that things are going well. 
Oh my God, I I can't believe that. I've got goosebumps all over. And, you know, I saw on Instagram when you first posted that Isla had talked, had spoken to the Times. And I thought, wow, what a courageous young girl to go through all that. And, you know, as I'm a registered nurse and I've had many family with um, cancer as well. And I was just thinking because all the emotions that you go through. I know you can't stop praising um, La Roche enough because the staff were really good, which is such a positive thing to know. And um, just for Isla to be at that, you know, emotional age, hormonal age, when we start our periods and oh. so forth, you know. Um, <laughs> um, beautiful. I'm yeah. just, yeah, so, and also, you know, um, you know, what did it feel like as a family? Like, uh, what, ex how did you all experience and go through it together? Because um, it's devastating. It's like you've had the carpet pulled from beneath your feet, you know? Yes, uh, it is. But I think in terms and on the scale of what so many people have had to go through, during this pandemic, but at any stages in their lives, I think this was this was doable. Um, this was very challenging, as you say. I think emotionally, as a mom, it was very very tough. Um, there was a lot of guilt for not having picked up on it sooner. A kind of a lot of soul searching. Is there something in where we live, in what I've fed her that has, has caused this to come out? Mm -hmm. And that's where I say that the. Um, the support team medically around us here could not have been better. From the beginning, there was a lot of reassurance. This, this is just something that's happened. It's a rogue cell. A lot of explanation, not just to me, but to Isla, about the type of cancer that it was. So she had um, a malignant germ tumour in her ovary, um, which can manifest either as in adolescent ovarian cancer or testicular in, in a young boy. And it, it absolutely comes when they hit puberty. So there was no coincidence there that it was coming at that time. And, and the cell just goes crazy and grows like mad. But on the plus side, it stays located. It doesn't tend to spread all over the body, which this one didn't. It was very much located in one tumor which shrunk and was killed very, very dramatically, actually, with the chemotherapy stays that we had. So getting that news as well, I think, I think also for, for me, for us as a family, the background in sport really helped because what sport teaches you is you do what you can each day. You make a plan, you stick to the plan, and you, you take it day by day, and, and you, you, you feed and you look after your body and, and try and support that and your mind in, in the best way possible. And so for me, that really helped to be given the plan at Lachey Hospital to have the doctors explain and to go through it. Um, what was hard was the fact that it wasn't me going through it. It was my daughter. And of course, every mother wants to be able to, to do it in their place. Uh, instead, I just had to support uh, as, as well as I could um, and be there for her. And I guess take the brunt on some of those emotional days to uh, and just try and help her recover in the best way possible what was hard was when her um, before chemotherapy stays if her white blood cell counts had not come back up enough we couldn't go back in and that for me was very frustrating because there's nothing you can do you're just sitting waiting for her body to recover and she actually handled those days far better than I did because she just said to her, chill out mum it'll come up in its own time and I actually don't mind because it gives me a break before I have to go back in whereas I was okay I want to just get on with this and just kill this tumour as much as possible um, before the surgery um, and then when she had the surgery again the surgeon was amazing the surgeon was also a runner so he was great at explaining to me how the recovery process would go, how she would feel, reassuring me that he checked out the other ovary, it looked fine. Um, and then I think there still is that, that period or that um, period of time where we waited to know that the first checkup would go okay, she's got her period back. So while there's no guarantee, there's every indication that she still has her fertility, which was very, very important to her. So yeah, fingers crossed things are going well. She's back playing hockey. Her energy is coming back. She's done phenomenally well at school in terms of trying to, to catch up the schoolwork. Again, the, the teachers that she's had have been great. 
uh, and the network of friends around her too. And I think that's what's important in any walk of life is that we have that network of support and friends around us and we're not afraid to lean on them and we're there for them in turn when they need to, to lean on us. And I, as you said at the beginning, I've been so grateful to, to all of my friends and family. I, mean, I had friends who drove home cooked pizzas from Monaco to Lakshay Hospital in the middle of lockdown because that was the only thing she said she could eat. And the gratitude I think that you feel as a mother when you see your daughter actually eating something um, was huge. So to, to those friends, thank you so much. To the friends who supported me with my son as well. I have an amazing friend, Jenny, who um, her daughter was in the same year as my daughter and son is in the same class as my son. And so just to know that she was there looking out for my son because I couldn't be there. His, his dad was obviously there as well, but just to make sure that that support group was around there because there is that guilt too. That you can't focus too much on one child and not be there for bedtime stories and homework um, with my son. So to have friends that filled that gap and helped to, to cover that, um, I'm hugely grateful for that. Oh, that's wonderful. I got goosebumps all the time. My heart is going out to you and I know everybody else's heart will be going out to you because it's not easy, you know, trying to put on a brave face for your loved one, be it a child especially. Um, and I know um, I listened to the podcast interview with Moving Forward with Cancer and mm -hmm. I know how important it was, um, like your daughter had said, she was worried about losing her hair. And it was so sweet that one of her friends, you know, um, had bought her the, the hair mask by mistake. So obviously not thinking, so the hair obviously looks so natural, <laughs> you don't think about it. And no, she knew. She, oh, she knew, knew that that friend actually knew that was what, but it was actually a wonderful light moment. So it yeah. was after she had the surgery, she was recovering. Her hair was non-existent at that time. Um, but and this friend knew that, but she just bought the treat things for Isla's birthday, and it happened to include a hair mask, and it didn't yeah. click when Isla took it out. She was like, "Oh, a hair mask," and and Fiorina said, "Well, yeah," and she's like, "Oh, yeah," <laughs> and then she was mortified. Um, but it was actually it was at the point where they could laugh about it um, uh, and move on from that. So I think you also need that. You also need to have a sense of humor and and kind of to to lighten up about it a little bit. Yeah, it helps to to get through it. And it was wonderful that she did have her two best friends and like when she was talking about when she was going to school, when she went back to school and obviously like you'd said in the talk that, you know, initially you could only say she's not coming to school and use COVID as an excuse for so long and then, you know, when you have to tell people or oh, this is what's happened to my daughter or if she has to tell people and she said she was so grateful for her two friends walking into school with her and climbing up the five steps or five, fifth floor and then they'd go up to six, but coming to meet her in the lunch breaks and in between classes, you know, I think, you know, that's a real token to how much friendship and loyalty and just all that community and support. So, and, um, yeah, talking because we're talking about children, I remember the last time that we spoke, there was a problem with a young girl who did pass a nine-year-old girl in London, and nobody wanted to, um, she'd had a severe asthma attack, and nobody wanted to take the responsibility for the really badly polluted air. And I know that you're involved with clean air. Do you know... Mm. Do you know whether anybody's actually taken the responsibility yet or it, whether they've done anything about cleaning the air? Or I know since on the first lockdown in, um, in Monaco that um, the pollution went down 80% in Paris anyway, and the next lockdown it only went down 20%. But you know, I'm guessing globally, if everybody stuck to the rules, the pollution would have gone down minimum 80%. But um, th it's obviously a big problem. You as a runner, all the people that go out running, but just our children and family, you know, us going for walks in polluted air. You know, could you explain to us or if you have any more information? 
Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's it's really important for me. So I work with um, I work with World Athletics as a clean air ambassador and a UN advocate for for clean air. Um, and you're right. I mean, I think as as an athlete, as a mom, it's extremely important to me that everybody has that basic human right to be able to to go outside to exercise and to breathe in clean air and Ella Roberta as you were talking about was yeah. the, sadly the nine-year-old girl who who died in London and um, lived very close to a busy road had several asthma attacks um, and it took a long time for the authorities to accept that air pollution was a significant factor in her death and her mum worked very very hard and had the honour of, of meeting her uh, and just trying to to support that because that should that should never happen um, every child should have the right to to grow up breathing clean air and we really need to all be doing more um, and I, I don't want to be a, a hypocrite either I mean I still have to take flights we all still have to move around life still has to go on but I think that the the powers that be and that can be the big um, pollutants uh, companies and governments and countries need to take this seriously and need to act on it. So what World Athletics are doing is putting clean air quality monitors or air quality monitors in stadia around the world um, to measure the air quality and to basically just provide information. So to provide information to the industries in those cities, hey, this is the, this is the levels we're at, it's not good enough, do better but also to the people wanting to go out and exercise, these are the best times. So it's not perfect, but if you choose this time of the day, it's a safer time to exercise. And at least if people are armed with that information, then they can make the choice. Because what we were saying was, um, for example, if you go out for a 90 minute run in Tampere, Finland, for every 90 minutes of that run, you're getting positive health benefits. If you go out for a 30 minute run in New Delhi, after 15 minutes, you're getting negative health benefits. So it's actually detrimental to your health and you'd be better off sitting inside watching TV. And that's shocking. And when you think about the kids running around playing on the streets there, you imagine what it's doing to their lungs. It's not right. Um, and that's why I think that even before we talk about the implications of the COVID pandemic on all of that, something needed to be done. So mm. yes, the pandemic was horrific, but I also try and look at the, um, at the positives to come out of it. And there have been some. Um, the fact that the pollution dropped globally and that people realized that. The pe fact that people realized that with a slower pace of life, maybe they got a better quality of life. Maybe they talked to their kids more. Maybe they got to, to sit down and have home cooked meals as a family more. Um, maybe there were other things that dropped like people weren't doing enough sport to begin with. Certainly children lost out massively in that social contact and in being able to access sports clubs so that's another of the things that i'm extremely passionate about is supporting kids to to get back to those physical activity levels which are necessary um, because i think for adults we're a little bit used to that we're used to maybe those phases in our life where we get out of shape we accept that it's not going to feel great for a little bit but we're, we're going to work hard to get back into shape the kids aren't used to that and have never been used to that. They've kind of sailed along at that magical level of physical activity and taken it for granted that they can run around and do everything. And so to explain to them, okay, you might be out of shape, you might be a little bit overweight, but there are safe and healthy ways to get back into shape and you need to be supported in doing that. It's different and it, it's a whole different language to the language that you would use explaining to adults. Um, and so I think that's an area that I'm extremely passionate about now is that the kids that weren't fortunate to have that family support around them and to keep their sport going need to have that support now because psychologically, uh, academically, it has a huge impact. How physically active and fit you are affects so many areas of your life. And I think we really need to make sure that there aren't, there aren't, there isn't anybody dropping through the cracks, but there aren't kids dropping through the cracks uh, and we need to support them better. Yeah, I, I was chatting to some of the ladies before you come on to the call 
and saying, you know, all those positive things that you just mentioned, um, how important it is because when it first happened, some people weren't used to their significant partner being there and working around the clock and then throwing children and you have the homeschooling, cooking, cleaning and trying to work and they're freaking out. But so I started wellness circles and I think, you know, just so everybody knew that they were in the same boat t together and everybody could give each other tips how they were dealing with having someone around the clock and things like that. But to make a family meal and everybody play their own little part in it, you know, and um, getting together, you know, it's so lovely, like, it's so, so wonderful that people could be with their children or their families and, or just be with yourself because mm -hmm. a lot of people are not used to me time. And um, it's so important, a lot of people keep so busy, they're not in touch with their feelings and emotions and they're not sure what they really want to be doing with their lives. They're just like, go, go, go to block everything out. So this gave them that opportunity to just slow down. And I know a lot of people have lost um, finance, they've lost their jobs, maybe their job doesn't work anymore. But now is the time that they can really choose the life that they deserve and desire. And because many of us have been encouraged by our family, become a doctor, dentist and so forth. But now they can choose what they really want to be. And I think, you know, because I come from a medical background, I know that a lot of people, even with having the vaccinations, there's, you know, for's and against that people are worried about. But it seems to be the people who keep fit in general, when they have the vaccinations, they're recovering from the side effects and so forth. And obviously, like with a serious illness that um, Isla had, you know, I'm sure because she fitness is a big part of her life as well, that probably played a, a part in her recovery from the illness as well. And I think because athletes have that determined, focused mindset. So what tips can you give to everyone? You've just given loads, but what, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Just um, general life well. tips or? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I th I think you, you've touched on, on a lot of them there. I think um, um, one analogy that I, I love, I, I read about it in a book years and years ago, because I, I used to read a lot to handle my nerves before competitions. Um, and it was in a James Patterson novel, and it was actually just about five balls that we juggle in life. And they are integrity, uh, health, family, friends, and career. Uh, and they're all really important. Um, but there's one key difference and the career ball is made of rubber. The other ones are a lot more fragile and you really have to look after those and take care with them. The career one, you can take a few more risks with, you can try and throw it higher. If you drop it, it's going to bounce. It's going to take some time to get it back to where it was, um, but it's not the end of the world. If you drop one of the others, then you really are in trouble. So I guess that's something that I've always held true to, like, look after your family and friends, appreciate them, value them and be there for them. And don't be afraid to lean on them and use them. Um, integrity is, is key to, to absolutely everything. I think we are what we believe in and what we stand up for. And it's one of the things that my dad, my grandma, my parents have always instilled in me is you stand up for what you believe in. And it's something that I see in Isla every day. I mean, she will shout out against something that she thinks is, is wrong against one of her friends or, or just in, in life. Um, and I'm so, so proud of that in her. And I will never try and, and knock that down. I think it, it's very, very important. Sometimes it's not what makes us more popular that we need to say. It's, it's what feels right to us. And what my grandma always used to say was every once in a while, step outside of your life and look back in and make sure that you're proud of the person that you are and the way that you're living your life. And if you're not, change it. Um, and I think that again is something that I've always tried to, to pass on to my kids um, because it's so, so important. It gives us that strength that when life does knock you and it will, there are difficult periods that we get through, but I think staying true to who you are and standing up for what you believe in certainly helps you to stay strong through those tough times and to believe that you will come through 
to to better times and health is, is is so so important as we've talked about all through this if you don't look after your mental and physical health um, then it, it's so so hard um, and so I think doing what you can to look after your body because our bodies are amazing things and if we support them and look after them I'm um, talking about mental health as much as physical health then they will will support us to do everything that we want to do in life and to to aim for those goals and aim for those dreams and I guess that's that's another part of it is setting goals and working steadily towards those goals because if you don't stretch yourself and stretch yourself with full health you will never really know what you're capable of achieving and um that's that's something that my coach said to me when I was 11 um and believed in me and trusted in me when I kind of I guess formed some pretty lofty goals which I didn't achieve um in terms of, of Olympic medals Olympic goals um but I did achieve so much more because I set those goals and because I stretched myself to to see what I could achieve um so that's what I think is very important is setting goals and working towards them steadily and accepting that you're not going to achieve them first time you may not ever achieve them but in working towards them and in finding work around each time you hit those setbacks um that you will get stronger and you will at, at a certain point in your life be able to look back and be proud of those moments that you've achieved oh my god that really you know resonates through my entire being it being and um we will definitely get that typed out and send it to <laughs> all the other group members. It was fantastic advice. And um, so can you give also any tips on for anybody's kids who want to be an athlete or if there's any young ones here as well? Because you're just so amazing. Um, I think for me with, with kids and sport, I think the most important thing is that and I feel really passionate about it, is that every child be given that opportunity to, to try lots of different things and to try the everything, to find what lights that passion for them. Um, for me, obviously it was running. I kind of see that a little bit in my son. Um, with my daughter, I think there are other things that, that she's passionate about. She's an amazing runner and she could be that if she wanted to be. But I think it's important that she finds the thing that she really wants to do because when you've got that motivation, that's what's going to keep you going through the, through the tough times that won't feel like tough times because you're doing what you love. And it doesn't have to be sport. Um, but what I do push my kids to do is be physically active and to stay fit. Um, so they don't have to take it to elite level, but they just have to be, be fit and healthy um, because I, I'm convinced that it helps them do better at school. It will help them be better people. It will teach them to work as a team. It will help them concentrate better. It will help them handle those setbacks better. So there are so many things in there. And I think that would be my key advice to any parent is to support your children without pushing them or forcing them. We're not living our lives through them. We're supporting them to live the best lives that, that they can do. And sometimes that does mean, yes, pushing them to do their homework and, and be the baddie and keep them out the door to do, to do something. Um, but sometimes it also means allowing them the freedom to, to try all those things and to really invest in what they feel passionate about. Paula, what small steps would you incentive, give an incentive to others, such as walking to school, for example, or taking Absolutely. I mean, I think those, those little steps can, can make a, a huge difference in the daily lives. Um, and I think that's what's one of the things that we're so very fortunate with, with here in Monaco is that you can, you can pretty much walk to work. Um, you've got no excuse wherever you work. You've got chance and time to, to walk to work. Um, kids can walk to school safely. Um, there are super friendly policemen on the crossing, so parents can kind of be a little bit more relaxed. Um, and they can take those little steps towards um, independence safely uh, and appreciate that. And it can become ingrained in their daily life. So yes, you're right. If you're just start taking the lift in the apartment building and just walking those stairs every day that's going to add up those little things are going to add up set yourself a, a goal each day and each week and give yourself those little rewards when you hit those goals so it might even be just 
every morning walking up the stairs, back to your apartment, every evening walking up the stairs. And then that's one goal hit. And then trying to increase that to walking up the stairs at work or to walking a little bit further each day. It doesn't have to be walking. Um, we're getting into the hotter, warmer weather. Just get out for a swim in the morning. Go and really appreciate how close to, to nature we are. We are fortunate to, to live and that we have that opportunity available to us. And just take that time while you're doing the physical activity to actually appreciate everything that is good and not worry about the things that are bad right now. So put those things that you're dealing with that are there, the tough things on the back burner for the time that you're exercising and focus on, on being alive, feeling good and thinking of solutions. I always find that while I'm running, it's the best thinking time ever. And if I can't solve things that are stressing me out before I go for a run, nine times out of 10, I'll find some, if not the answer, then some way to help with dealing with it until I find the answer while I'm out running. And I don't know whether it's the extra oxygen to my brain or just the fact that I'm just a little bit more relaxed. Um, maybe it's my meditation time. But I think finding that time each day to, to think about the good things and to, to de-stress is very important for everyone. And a lot of times to exercise, that really helps. Thank you. Also, will you explain to everyone about Families on Track? Because a few people have just texted me. Yep, absolutely. So Families on Track was an initiative that was, I guess, kind of born out of a, a relay event that I did as part of the Monaco run with my daughter. So she ran 3K, I ran 7K, and she finished and said that was so much fun. She said, why don't we do things like this um, for families to be able to do together? So I started thinking along the lines of an Ekiden relay, which is actually a Japanese um, relay that breaks down the marathon into manageable chunks uh, through 10K, 7.2K, 5Ks, um, and um, breaks that up into a relay, but it's run along the marathon route. Now, of course, you can't do that with families because you can't abandon kids at some point along the route. So we then came up with the families on back idea uh, which was running, it's running 10 kilometers as a family, um, but it can be adapted to run a marathon as a family or uh, five kilometers as a family, depending on the time that you have. And we did it through a changeover zone. So it's actually, uh, now that we're thinking about it and trying to get it restarted, it's, it's fairly COVID friendly because you're in your little family bubble and then you go out on the course to run either a 250 meter loop, a 500 meter loop or a 1K loop and you collect your colored ball, you add up your distance, and when you've run 10K, you've achieved the distance, and then you run through the finish line as a family, uh, and you celebrate. So um, I worked together with Steve Cram at Events of the North, and he helped me to, to kind of bring it to life, if you like, in Durham in uh, 2019, in July. And um, we had a phenomenal day, even though the heavens opened and it poured all day the amount of families that still came out and had a lot of fun people came up to me afterwards and said I haven't run since I was at school and now I went out and I ran with my kids and my kids were challenging me to run quicker and quicker over the 250 meter loop and I'm really excited now about keeping it up and I think that was what we're trying to do just to get kids and families spending quality time together away from screens as a family doing something that's physically healthy and having a lot of fun as well and making that commitment to then maybe go out and do that once a month, once a week as a family um, and to keep doing that. That's what we were trying to do. So it's now coming back in Durham this year. It's going to be part of RunFest at the end of August in the UK. And um, we brought it on as a virtual challenge with Berkshire schools in the UK as the 215 challenge. And um, brought that to Monaco as well as part of the 215 Challenge MC, um, which we're now talking about in collaboration with the Princess Charlene Foundation, um, which gave me a lot of support there. We also did 15 minutes with Paula, just trying to encourage people to just take 15 minutes in their day and just use whatever they had in the space they had to get physically active. Um, and so we absolutely want to bring families on track to Monaco. I think we have perfect venues in the Love Auto Promenade when it's finished and in the the Rosary as well where they've run their finish line in the, in the past that we could safely do that so as soon as we can 
we are planning to to bring that there again with the with the goal just being to get families out having fun and enjoying spending time being active together yeah i know there was a survey and um, people the children were asked if there was one thing you could have what would it be and I think 90% of the children wrote, spend time with mummy and daddy or something to that effect. And like you said, you know, with COVID, this has made it possible. You know, there's so mm. many jokes, you know, with the tick boxes, spend time with family, tick. You know, not go to school, tick, <laughs> and so <laughs> forth. So, so I think that's wonderful. And I think you had plans to do it on Lovato Beach as well with the new extensions before all this yes, COVID. Like, absolutely. Um, I had already been talking to, to RSM uh, Athletism in, um, in Monaco about putting it into the Lava to cross country, um, which used to take part every November. Um, so I guess now it's just seeing what the beach area is like when it reopens. I think we're all excited yeah. to, to get down there, get out there with the kids uh, and, and enjoy those, those facilities. Um, and yeah, take those those steps back and that back to, to normal life, if, if you like. But I, I think what is exciting is that we have we have also learned things and we've changed um, oh, yeah. as a community, I think, through this pandemic. Um, so I think it's important that we we try to, to keep the things that were good and that we found worked really well, um, while at the same time getting back to the things that we all know and we all need. Um, and that society needs to, to get back to. And I think that social contact and interactivity needs to happen. That traveling again needs to happen. Maybe some of the stresses we, we can do without and certainly some of the, the family time that we rediscovered, the health benefits that we discovered, we need to keep those. Um, and the health benefits that we lost, we need to fight hard to, to get back in place. So I think it is about maybe using that sense of perspective that I hope we gained a little bit during this pandemic because you had the time to slow down and to look at things and to think about what was really important. And so I guess my biggest advice coming out of the pandemic is that we hold on to that perspective and that we hold on to what's really important and that we kind of work together towards that. Thank you. Hi. Yes, I am a local American French in, in, in the, on the Riviera for 14 years. And I have been on a very slow pattern over the last, like the last 10, 14 years of improving my health, improving my fitness level. Um, but I've just gone very gradually because over my life, my weight has fluctuated like a lot. And uh, finally, I just decided no more, you know, crash diets, no more things that are just beyond what I can do. It just has to be the easy way or it won't happen. And um, I was really surprised two years ago to find out that um, I could actually <laughs> lose a lot of weight just by through diet like I actually had that willpower or whatever it was um and I actually like got down to the size I think the last time I had been to that size I was like probably 10 years old <laughs> and um I liked it but but it wasn't sustainable because I started getting weak I started getting um you know, people were telling me this might impact your, if you're not feeding, if you're constantly starving yourself, this might really impact the way your body is running, even though you don't look super slim to us, like, you know, you don't look anorexic, but you are kind of acting that way. So then I, my question that I'm getting to for you has to do with sports, because then I moved into that I became really interested in sports. And now it's like, especially like you said, like, the better your fitness level is, then the more you just want to do it because it's just easier and mm -hmm. you have more strength and energy and power throughout your day. Um, but now <laughs> I've built some muscle. I'm happy, but my issue that keeps coming up is sports injuries. I know Kylie is a therapist who helps with these things, but you know, you have to keep in mind, Paula, like I just do it. I get tips wherever I can, but I don't, I know a lot of coaches, but I don't have my own fitness coach. I just kind of go at it. I go swimming. Yesterday I was swimming. 
Beverly gave me the idea as well yesterday on our call. Um, is there anything you can recommend just for a person who doesn't really have a huge support system like athletes, professional athletes do, um, to deal with this thing of the sports injuries? Because I always want to do more than my body seems to be able to do. Yeah, so I, I think um, the biggest thing is um, to, to always remember to, to fuel your body uh, and to listen to your body. Um, so as I, I talked about before, our bodies can do amazing things, but they're not, they're not magic. If we don't put the right fuel in them and support them, um, give them enough rest, enough sleep, um, and the right foods quickly enough after physical activity, then they can't recover as quickly. So I think it's about making sure, yes, a balanced diet. Um, I don't know what sort of injuries, um, but if there's skeletal injuries, then making sure that your calcium and your bone density, calcium levels are high and your bone density is good. Um, after you've worked out, it's a really good idea to stretch afterwards, um, stretch beforehand as well, but to stretch afterwards and to get some fluids into you and some carbohydrates into you within 20 minutes of finishing exercise because that helps your muscles to recover well um, and I think stopping at the first sign of pain it's it's a really hard thing to to get right um, the pains that you can run through and the, or exercise through and the pains that you can't so it's better to err on the side of caution if you feel something just stop just take a rest day then stretch it out ice never does any harm um, you can't really go wrong with ice. You might, some t with some injuries, heat might work better, um, but ice is never going to do any harm. So I think icing an injury really, really helps it. And um, stretching, working on strength as well. So kind of, I guess it's the old thing, don't, don't try to fly before, walk, don't try to run before you can walk. Um, make sure that your body is strong enough to move to the level of physical activity that you're trying to. So, so build up gradually and, don't underestimate rest as an important part of the training. Like that enables your body to recover. Think of it like steps. The rest will help you to move up to the next step. Is there anything you'd like to share with the group? Like which um, website you're on Instagram so they can follow you on Instagram. We can put all the details up. Um, no, I mean, I think, yeah, I, I am on Instagram. I, I, yeah, I think what people can do to, to support um, Families on Track, if it does come to Monaco and um, the Princess Charlene Foundation and the 215 challenges that we were trying to bring out just to support the kids. I think we already have a, a great community in this whole area, not just in Monaco, in the whole yeah. of the, this Riviera area. Um, so what we can do to support that would be great. Um, yeah, I mean, I can't, as I say, underline and, and say enough how much gratitude I have for the whole team at L'Arche um, and indeed at L'Enval um, for the way that they supported Ida and I will continue to do what I can to support them through this. And as, as you talked about Gemma's Move Against Cancer charity in the UK, yeah. um, we're now working together with them moving forward uh, as well, bringing them on as a charity partner with um, Families on Track and just doing what we can to try and support the families of people going through this as much as, as, as the people going through it. Thank you very much. And um, there's um, so many people in the group that send their love and they've all asked me to say if there's anything at all that you need in your life, they're more than help, happy to help if you ever need to have advice or help from anyone. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank Thank you. you Thanks, everybody. Have a good Bye -bye. day. Thank Bye. you.